Lauren Huff, welcome to the Livewire House Party. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> um, a lot of people, myself included, first found out about your writing uh, because of this essay that you wrote about your time working as a cable installer <laughs> that kind of went, as they say, viral. Um, did, is that what led to you getting the deal for writing this book? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, a couple of people read that. Um, yeah, I really <laughs> didn't expect that to happen. Like I was failing out of creative writing and trying to not write a paper. So I just got stoned and got on Twitter and like, y'all want to hear some cable guy stories? Oh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the way that works is every lesbian does know every lesbian. And one of my friends from D.C. <laughs> works at HuffPost and was like, hey, my editor wants this story if you can write it. So I did. And yeah, it... Uh, I mean, I've been working on a book, but you kind of half-assing it. Um, sort of had to actually write it then. Because, <laughs> yeah, suddenly everybody wanted a book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that thing I wasn't writing. All right, cool. <laughs> How many of the of the essays from from the, the book that I've got here, Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing, how many of those had you already written or had some idea of when you started the book project? Uh I mean, the, the cable guy was definitely written. I added some to it, but uh, there was one other essay um, and we split it into two and just sort of hacked it apart and used different parts of it in different places. Um, yeah, everything. I mean, I'd worked on random parts of random stories, but putting them into essay form was where things got fun because I could add commentary. It turns mm. out, and I... I mean, that was kind of the thing about the cable guy stories. I didn't really care. I thought it was a throwaway. So I just wrote everything I thought and felt and let myself get pissed off and write it. And sort of the same with these essays. I'd written the stories before, but just very listing things that happened. Turns out it works a little better when you say what you think about it. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so you had the stories, but they went through a, a process where you you refined them and kind of attacked them from a bit of a different angle or perspective for the book? Yeah. I mean, it's like job interview questions. You go into a job interview with like your four anecdotes and if they say teamwork, that's the one I'm going to use. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but you take your life apart that way too. And yeah, if I want to write an essay about shame, I've got, I've got a few stories for that. So it's just compiling <laughs> those together and putting them into one. Were you studying something other than nonfiction when you did your Twitter rant about being a cable <laughs> installer? Yeah, I'd written a, I mean, I'd written a lot of novels that sounded exactly like someone else, but I was writing a book about the Dust Bowl because um, oh, wow. I'd given up selling a memoir. It, it hadn't sold. Like every huh. editor in New York, I thought, had seen it and it had not sold. And take fuck because it was terrible. It was just, it was a bad book. It was just, and here's some more bad things that happened and I'm sad. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't know what the fuck I was writing. Um, I keep swearing. Oh yeah. One of our producers said, make sure to give Lauren a heads up before the interview that try to keep the swearing to a minimum. And I forgot to give you that heads up, but apparently your reputation yeah. precedes you. We saw, no, we saw your tweet. Yeah, we saw your tweet that said that you just like said fuck in front of Terry Gross. And so we were, whatever. And we were like, oh yeah. Thank F. Thank <laughs> and see, the problem Fine. is I don't want to thank God, so I thank F, and then who knows who that is. Oh, what were we talking thank about? Dolly Parton. Thank Dolly Parton. <laughs> yeah. Thank Dolly Parton. Uh, I can always thank a Dolly big Parton. Part, a, a big part of this book, of course, is the fact that, that you were raised in this really extreme uh, religious cult, the Children of God. For, for people that maybe aren't familiar with what the uh, kind of overall vibe of that cult was, what was it like for you growing <laughs> up in that? I mean, the ultimate vibe for, I don't, it's what was hard it to like say for because you? Let everybody, me, let me. so, so here's the thing. Yeah, it was a sex cult and it's famously known for a sex cult, but as soon as you're putting a schedule on the wall, I don't know how much fun a sex cult really is, even for the adults <laughs> who thought they were joining a sex cult for free love. Um, I used to switch my stepdad's name over to people he hated. You write uh, that in the book. I mean, that's the I? thing you really did. So they, they have this calendar there. of who would be yeah, shacking was, up with, with whom, and, and you would actually kind of mess with 
with that I, equation. Yeah, I would totally mess with it. But for, I mean, for me, for the kids, it was just we were the child care. We were the housekeeping. We were the kitchen crew. Um, we, my sister was in charge of the kitchen at like 14. It was for a huge home, of like 300 people. It was ridiculous. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of changing diapers and watching little kids and studying and reading and memorizing verses. It's, I think people are picturing like white robes and ceremonies mm. when they hear the word cult and it was just bad clothing and chores <laughs> so. one of the things i wondered about because i actually lived on a religious commune when i was a kid and uh, a big part of it was the end times and i know that was something that was part of of this cult that you were in and i remember for me as a kid it was like a really bad feeling to go to bed most nights thinking yeah this is probably it like, How much has the pandemic fucked with you because of that, though? <laughs> because it has with me. I'm like, damn it. I finally stopped, like, preparing for the end of the world in my head. There was always that thing at the back of my mind. I didn't believe in the Antichrist. I don't believe in the Antichrist. I don't think the Mark of the Beast is going to happen. I don't think I'm going to be running around in the woods fighting the Antichrist soldiers. But I still have, like, two months of food stocked up just in case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and now the pandemic happened and it, suddenly it was all right. I just, everybody needs to get their shit together. I, I, I'm not doing the end of the world again. I'm just so not. some part of your brain though, is still holding on to, you know, some of that, the, those teachings, because that's not something that has really traveled uh, into my adult life with me, but there's still part of it that kind of lives in your brain. All right. Well, you're better than me. Um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, I don't I don't think the world is going to end. I just like to be prepared for I think it's some sort of weird anxiety. I have a sleeping bag in the back of my truck. I have I'm always prepared to have to sleep in my car. Um mm -hmm. so I don't know so much if that comes from the cult or just insecurity of my younger days when I mean, the most recent time I had to sleep in my car besides the pandemic, which again, yeah, sleeping in my car turned out to be useful. I drove across country and shat in a Confederate cemetery to avoid going into a truck stop where no one was wearing masks. <laughs> but uh, I found an officer's grave. It's fine. It, it's... <laughs> he owned people. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. I don't. It's cool. <laughs> it's great though if you're walking around with a dog through a cemetery. Like nobody looks twice if you like squat between headstones because right? you, you could be taking a picture of Grandpappy. I, who knows? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, sleeping in your car is kind of a pretty big theme in this book as well. Actually, we got to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to get into that more. Just kind of like what your life looked like after the cult and through all these different jobs and iterations and a lot of the poverty that, that you were dealing with at the time. Uh, we're talking to Lauren Huff. Uh, her new book is Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing. Uh, we'll be back with more with Lauren on the Live Wire House Party in just a moment. Welcome back to the Live Wire House Party from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarella. We're talking to Lauren Huff. Uh, her new book is Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing. Um, you grew up in this uh, Children of God cult, which had you moving all over the place and also involved a lot of poverty. And then you, you sort of went into the Air Force and you write in this book that happy, well-adjusted people don't join the military. <laughs> 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 they really don't though. Um, I don't it's I mean sometimes they do though. It's it's like it's our college program in this country. If mm -hmm. you don't get a scholarship and your parents can't afford to pay for it, mm -hmm. it's the fastest way out of your hometown and you're promised a college degree, promised mm -hmm. success in life and yeah, you know, that may work for some and good for them. Like I have a friend I went to basic training with as an officer now, did the right track went to school everything else and she's reading my book about how it can go the other way i guess where you end up living in your car afterwards well right because you were really targeted while you were in the military for being gay and also you were accused of of, of torching your own car you actually went on trial for that i mean you were facing what 10 years in military prison yeah uh it was a little scary yeah i I, <laughs> it's a, it was a strange thing that my, it was hard to take seriously on some level because at some point it was so fucking ridiculous. 
who would torch their own car to avoid going to Greece? That was my motive, <laughs> mm-hmm. according to them, is why would I want to leave Sumter, South Carolina and go live on an island in Greece by the beach? That would be torture. I should. <laughs> right. And so you light your Acura on fire so <laughs> yeah. as to avoid that deployment. That was that. That was their working theory. That was that yeah. was their working theory. Um, it made no sense. And because I hadn't told anybody about death threats, I were, I served under "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." So showing someone, "Hey, I'm being harassed for being gay," felt a whole lot like saying I'm gay, and then I would be thrown out. I was trying to save my fucking career. There, I did it again. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to. I can't be around. My niece gets on me too. I just start handing her money when I walk in now. <laughs> <laughs> the swear jar runneth over. I do. I just hand her money when I walk in because she started a swear jar to raise funds for like carbon offsetting only with swearing. You just start. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I figure it's for a good cause. <laughs> um, you know when you so you you did end up you know, leaving the military dishonorably discharged, I guess, because you sort of admitted that you were gay after you didn't end up having to go to military prison. And, and then you sort of end up as a, as a bouncer at a bar in DC. And but uh, one of the things that really seems to be another theme of this book is just dealing with a lot of poverty. And I'm kind of wondering uh, if you, for the folks listening to this who haven't had that experience of being totally broke and having no one to really bail them out or no kind of like fallback plan. It's just, what does that do to you emotionally to have that kind of pressure on you for years and years? It makes it hard to really think about. I mean, you're supposed to be digging out of it, but you're, you're constantly just solving the next crisis. It's, there's no, you don't have an ability to plan or to like try to strategize a way out of it. It's every single crisis. And part of the problem is, is being poor is expensive as hell. We, you can't cash a check without going to a cash check cashing place that takes money out of it. You, you know, you can't afford the dental work immediately. So you end up having to get a root canal. Mm -hmm. You can't fix your brakes. There goes your rotors, everything. Mm -hmm. There's a surcharge for everything and it's just for being poor. Um, Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I still occasionally say, Oh, I'm broke. And I remember I have a checking account. A Mm -hmm. lot of people just don't, that's not an option. They test your credit to get one. So Yeah. yeah, it, it, it's just, constantly frustrating there's an anxiety that never really leaves your chest Mm. Uh, we're talking to lauren huff her her new book of essays is leaving isn't the hardest thing um one of the things that was quite fascinating about this book to me and about your experience with this cult you were in as as a kid was i didn't realize that you had never seen actually seen like a picture of or the face of the guy who was kind of in charge of the cult because he'd been like in hiding during most of your childhood and then you just saw it in the newspaper. How old were you? I was 17. I was almost 18 when that showed up in the paper. Um, Yeah, I I don't know how much he wanted to be in hiding because that sounded cool or the FBI was really after him. I don't think the FBI gives a crap. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't. He just his little fantasy life that he was knighting, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, we never knew who he was or where he was. Um, I didn't know his name. All of our kids' comic books that we were supposed to read about his family, and they were just kind of set up as our that was our entertainment. It was super mm. fun. Um <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, the stories that are great lives. It's funny like when you don't have matching socks because people don't donate socks and you're living in this cult and you're basically in poverty, sleeping like 20 kids to a room on futons. And you look and you're reading these books of like the, the main, the head of the family and they had swimming pools and they were going on grocery trips and doing all sorts of fun stuff that you weren't doing. And I just hated them. I hated them so much for that. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I didn't, I've never seen his face. What was that so like saw it for in you? The paper. What, yeah, what was that like for you that day that you finally did see it? Uh, it was just a. It was, 
absurd is probably the best word for it. I mean, there was the initial shock of it that I stared at it for a while and then couldn't stare at it and then couldn't stop seeing it. And I'm sitting in class thinking about, I kept going to the bathroom to go read this little piece of paper that from the, oh. that I tore out of the paper with his face on it that said he was dead. He didn't look anything like I wanted him to look like, but he's got those. And now I, I mean, I think we all recognize them watching documentaries, Charles Manson or Ron Watkins, or just seeing those dead beady eyes. And I, recognize it now but yeah I, I couldn't look away from it and couldn't look at it is how it was like what was the experience of writing this book and 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 you said you'd had these stories you'd written them maybe in one form or another but sitting down and making this actual book and going back and and thinking about these events in your life and trying to make some meaning out of them or figure out your opinion on them did that help you process this stuff do you feel less burdened by the trauma of your experience now having written it all out in this book? God, I hate to say it because my shrink might hear this, but yes, it probably <laughs> hear they're did a big help. listener. <laughs> <laughs> it probably did help. Gary. Um, Gary. <laughs> but, <laughs> Shout out to Gary. 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 Um, yeah, it, the weird thing about it is you're looking at these stories from your past and you thought you knew what they meant. Mm. Um, every part of, I was writing about an argument I had with an ex. That's 15 years ago. And yeah, I hadn't really thought about it for 15 years. And it turns out I was wrong. Which is <laughs> infuriating. <laughs> yeah, there's something about looking at the past from an adult's eyes, even just little things. Like there's that moment we all realize that most of the adults who were mean to you were just hung over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of some another question that I wanted to ask. Um Believe it or not, about Twitter, because you're, I mean, this is a literary book. It's a, you know, the essays are, are like you said, this great mix of like scene and thinking, but you're also a writer who, I, I know you got the Cable Guy essay first spotted through this run of tweets that you did, and you're on Twitter all the time talking to people and stuff. And do you think Twitter can make a writer better in yeah. any way or... You do. In what yeah. ways do you it, think? Well, especially when it, the characters were limited at first. And don't get me wrong, I take full advantage of the double characters. Yeah, me but too. For you kids out there, we used to have a limitation. <laughs> wow. That is the weirdest back in my Yowza. day that we now have. <laughs> back in my day, we had fewer characters on Twitter. It's true. Back in the day, yeah. you had to the, cut. But yeah, to tell a joke, you had to cut every extra word. You had to figure out what exactly fit into the tweet to make it punch. Um, figuring out how to arranging things when you're writing a thread so that people will click on the first tweet, but also read the rest of them. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it helps. And I think it's a giant time suck that we're not getting paid for. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... God help me. I I do use it a lot. And yeah, I've used it to try to figure out how to tell a story. Yeah. So sometimes there are times when I was writing another essay where I I would be completely stuck on what I was supposed to write next and it's just add another tweet to it huh? and it'll work. And it does and it's infuriating, but that's it, awesome. <laughs> it does help. <laughs> We were talking to George Saunders like a few months ago and he said basically the same thing just with sentences. Like just like think about the next sentence that will want you to keep reading to the next sentence. So mm -hmm. it's I feel like it's the same strategy. Yeah, it is. I see, look, I mean what George Saunders said. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you you've had you've had so many uh different kind of jobs and titles in your life, Lauren, you know, uh uh, Air Force, uh, you've been an airman, you've been a, a bouncer, you've been a, you know, survivor of a cult, you've been a cable installer. Now, writer is, I guess, your primary job description. How does that feel to you? It's, it's, it is awesome. Um, yeah, I, I, I really haven't wrapped my head around it yet that I'll see my name on lists. These book lists keep coming out and I see my name next to Elizabeth McCracken's and it, 
blows my mind every time. <laughs> um, <laughs> someone tweeted that I something about my voice was reminded her of Mary Carr, and I was just horrified that Mary Carr might see that and be really angry. <laughs> 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 I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't want to embarrass y'all. Um, <laughs> yeah, it feels great though. I'm. I like it. There's also the problem of I've been. You start telling people like five years. Never tell someone you're writing a book, because after a while they stop asking, mm-hmm. and that's actually mm-hmm. the worst part. It is the worst part isn't when they're like, "Hey, how's your book coming along?" It's when they just stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally being able to post that link. I don't think I've been on Facebook in two years, but as soon as the book sold, uh, I slid right in. Guess what, <laughs> mother? Yeah. Hey, look at that. I caught myself. I did there it. There you go. All right. That's some real personal growth. Uh, Lauren Huff, the book is Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing. Uh, it's a really uh, an incredible read. Um, thank you so much for coming on LiveWire to tell us about it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Sorry about the swearing. <laughs> I, got a t- I got a text from our editor, Melanie. OMG, the swearing, LOL. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Melanie will, <laughs> Melanie will, I guess, <laughs> figure out uh, how 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 best to parse through that. But no, it was great. We like you being your natural self. We'll figure yeah. out how to make the rest of it work. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, Not it's at all. my it's brand. It's because you weren't allowed to know. swear in the cult. Right? Yeah. It's, just, it's it all really okay. is. It's like, it was like f- 15 years of not being able to use any word you wanted, and now you gotta. Yeah, now I gotta use them all while <laughs> on live wire. That is yes, the point. Indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, Lauren, thanks again so much. And really great job on the book as another uh, as another cult kid. <laughs> well, mine you. was much less. Mine was just, you know, run of the mill normal cult. So yeah, they're like, all it, fun in their own way. Yes, they Aww. are. They're all special <laughs> like snowflakes. All right. Hey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I think Molly probably will want to check in on the the getting of the file. Okay.